Welcome back. Today we're going to be reading the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian epic of creation, uh, with a bit of commentary by Joshua Mark. Um, I downloaded this from an encyclopedia. Um, this is one of the oldest creation stories in the world, um, and it's also a story of a murder, um, unsurprisingly, right? So it's a story of creation of the world, and it's also a story of the the victory of patriarchy, I suppose, is one interpretation for it. Um, we're going to go through many interpretations for it, uh, starting with some backstory by Joshua J. Mark. Um, I am going to read the full text, uh, too. That's what most of this is going to be, is going to be the full text. So if you don't want to hear the commentary, skip forward, like, I don't know, five minutes, six minutes, um, and then we'll get to the actual piece. The Enuma Elish, also known as the Seven Tablets of Creation, is the Mesopotamian creation myth whose title is derived from the opening lines of the piece, When on High. All of the tablets containing the myth found at Asher, Kish, Ashurbanipal's Pat Library in Nineveh, Sultan Tepe, and other excavated sites date to 1100 BC, but their chlorophons indicate that these are all copies of a much older version of the myth. This is an image of one version that we have. As Marduk, the champion of the young gods in the war against Tiamat, is of Babylonian origin, the Sumerian Ea Enki, or Anlil, thought to have played the major role in the original version of the story. Um, wait. Let me say that over again. As Marduk, the champion of the young gods in the war against Tiamat, is of Babylonian origin, the Sumerian Ea Enki, or Enlil, is thought to have played a major role in the original version of the story. The copy found at Asher has the god Asher in the main role, as was the custom of the cities of Mesopotamia. The god of each city was always considered the best and most powerful. Marduk, the god of Babylon, only figures prominently as he does in the story because most of the copies found are from Babylonian scribes. Even so, Ea still does play an important part in the Babylonian version of the Enuma Elish by creating human beings. Summary of the story. The story, one of the oldest, if not the oldest in the world, concerns, I mean, it's not the oldest story in the world. There are many older stories, but this is certainly one of the oldest written stories that we have. The elements in this story you see have buried or revised older story versions, the story of slaying of the serpent that we'll see. And all of the themes in this are actually much older than 1100 BC, but 1100 BC is when all of these themes were crystallized in this particular story, in this particular way. Um, yeah. The story, one of the oldest, if not the oldest in the world, oldest written in the world, concerns the birth of the god and the creation of the universe and human beings. In the beginning, there was only undifferentiated water swirling in chaos. Out of this swirl, the water is divided into sweet, fresh water, known as the god Apsu, and salty, bitter water, the goddess Tiamat. Once differentiated, the union of these two entities gave birth to the younger gods. These young gods, however, were extremely loud, troubling the sleep of Apsu at night and distracting him from his work by day. Upon the advice of his vizier, Mumu, Apsu decides to kill the younger gods. Tiamat, hearing of their plan, warns her eldest son, Enki, sometimes Ea, and he puts Apsu to sleep and kills him. From Apsu's remains, Enki creates his home. Tiamat, once the supporter of the younger gods, now is enraged that they have killed her mate. She consults with the god Quingu, who, Quingu, who advises her to make war on the younger gods. Tiamat rewards Quingu with the Tablets of Destiny, which legitimize the rule of a god and control the fates, as he wears them proudly on a breastplate. This is very similar to Moses' tablets and the, the plates that the Levitic priests would wear. Um, with Quingu as her champion, Tiamat summons the forces of chaos and creates eleven horrible monsters to destroy her children. Ea, Enki, and the younger gods fight against Tiamat futilely until from among them emerges the champion Marduk, who swears he will defeat Tiamat. 
Marduk defeats Quingu and kills Tiamat by shooting her with an arrow which splits her in two from her eyes flow the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Out of Tiamat's corpse, Marduk creates the heavens and the earth. He appoints the various the gods to various duties and binds Tiamat's eleven creatures to his feet as trophies to much adulation from the other gods, before setting their images in his new home. He also takes the tablets of destiny from Quingu, thus legitimizing his reign. After the gods have finished praising him for his great victory and the art of his creation, Marduk consults with the god Ea, the god of wisdom, and decides to create human beings from the remains of whichever the gods instigated Tiamat to war. Quingu is charged as guilty and killed, and from his blood, Ea creates Lulu, the first man to be a helper to the gods in their eternal task of maintaining order and keeping chaos at bay. As the poem phrases it, Ea created mankind, O oh, whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. On whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. Tablet 6, 33 to 34. Following this, Marduk arranged the organization of the netherworld and distributed the gods to their appointed stations. Tablet 6. The poem ends in Tablet 7 with long praise of Marduk for his accomplishments. Commentary. The Enuma Elish would later be the inspiration for the Hebrew scribes who created the text now known as the Biblical Book of Genesis. Prior to the 19th century CE, the Bible was considered the oldest book in the world because Eurocentric people are Eurocentric, and its narratives were thought to be a completely original. In the mid-19th century CE, however, European museums as well as academic and religious institutions sponsored excavations in Mesopotamia to find physical evidence for a historical corroboration of the stories in the Bible, which they largely failed to find. These excavations found quite the opposite, however, in that once cuneiform was translated, it was understood that a number of biblical narratives were Mesopotamian in origin. Famous studies, stories such as the fall of man and the great flood were originally conceived and written down in Sumer, translated and modified later in Babylon, and reworked by the Assyrians before they were used by the Hebrew scribes for the versions which appear in the Bible. Although the basic paradigm of the biblical narratives and the Mesopotamian stories align closely, there are still some significant differences. As noted by scholar Stephen Bertman, both Genesis and the Enuma Elish are religious texts which detail and celebrate cultural origins. Genesis describes the origin and founding of the Jewish people under the guidance of the Lord. Enuma Elish recounts the origin and founding of Babylon under the leadership of the god Marduk. Contained in each work is a story of how the cosmos and men were created. Each work begins by describing the watery chaos and primeval darkness that once filled the universe. Then light is created to replace the darkness. Afterward, the heavens are made, and in them heavenly bodies are placed. Finally, man is created. These similarities, notwithstanding the two accounts, are more different than alike. That was a little bit useless. I kind of regret reading that, but most of the commentary is okay. In revising the Mesopotamian creation story for their own ends, Hebrew scribes tightened the narrative and the focus, but retained the concept of an all-powerful deity who brings order from chaos. Marduk in the Enuma Elish establishes the recognizable order of the world, just as God does in the Genesis tale, and human beings are expected to recognize this great gift and honor the deity through service. In Mesopotamia, in fact, it is thought that humans were co-workers with the gods to maintain the gift of creation and keep the forces of chaos at bay. The Enuma Elish in Babylon Marduk gave prominence in Babylon during the reign of Hammurabi, which was 1792 to 1750 BCE, and at that point superseded the god, popular goddess Inanna in worship. And a lot of this story is about male gods superseding female gods in our understanding of creation. Um, and the earlier creation myths were less gendered and more androgynous, uh, but we'll get to that. But yeah, so it's important to note that when this story gained popularity in Babylon, it supplanted a, a more feminist religion. During Hammurabi's reign, feminist, I don't know, more feminine religion. During Hammurabi's reign, in fact, a number of previously popular female deities were replaced by male gods. The Enuma Elish, praising Marduk as the most powerful of all the gods, therefore became increasingly popular as the god himself rose in prominence and his city of Babylon grew in power. Scholar Jeremy Black writes, The rise of the cult of Marduk is closely connected with the political rise of Babylon from city-state to the capital of an empire. From the Kassite period, 
Marduk became more and more important until it was possible for the author of the Babylonian epic of creation to maintain that not only was Marduk king of all the gods, but that many of the latter were no more than aspects of his persona. The Enuma Elish was read and recited widely through Mesopotamia, but was especially important at the New Year festival in Babylon. During this festival, the statue of Marduk would be taken from the temple and, amidst the revelers, was created through the streets of the city, out the gates, to vacation in a small house built for this purpose. The Enuma Elish, especially, it is thought, the praise from Tablet 7 would be sung or chanted during this procession. And now we get to the text. Um, yeah, so it's a story about the creation of the world. It's a story about the triumph of patriarchy, I think. Um, I think that's a fair reading of this story. Um, and the story about the role of humans in all that. Um, so now I'm going to read the unabridged text. Maybe I'll throw in the occasional comment here or there. The following translation comes from Mesopotamian Creation Stories by W.G. Lambert and is used under Creative Commons license from the Etana website. The Enuma Elish, the Babylonian Epic of Creation. 11 minutes in, that's not bad. Okay. Tablet 1. When the heavens above did not exist, and the earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and the demiurge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. They had mingled their waters together. Before Meadowland had coalesced and Reedbed was to be found, this story likely comes from a place with Meadowlands and Reedbeds, the marshes in Iraq. Um, seems to be very likely the environment that this line is referring to. When not one of the gods had been formed, or had come into being, when no destinies had been decreed, the gods were created within them. Lamu and Laamu were formed and came into being, while they grew and increased in stature. Ansar and Kisar, who, ex who, excelled, them, were who, who excelled them, were created. They prolonged their days, they multiplied their years. Anu, their son, could rival his father's. Anu, the son, equaled Ansar, and Anu begot Nidimund, his own equal. So they say that Anu is a son here, but in the very next line they say that Anu is begetting, giving birth to Nidimund, creating his own equal. So the language is gendered, but in the structure you can see an earlier creation myth that wasn't so gendered, that had all of these gods as sort of dual gendered forms. And Anu begot Nudimund, his own equal. Nudimun, uh, Nudimud, Nud, Nudimud was the champion among his fathers, profoundly discerning, wise, of robust strength, very much stronger than his father's begetter, Ansar. He had no rival among the gods, his brothers. The divine brothers came together. Their clamor got loud, throwing Tiamat into a turmoil. They jarred the nerves of Tiamat. And by their dancing, they spread alarm in Anduruna. Apsu did not diminish their clamor, and Tiamat was silent when confronted with them. Their conduct was displeasing to her. Yet, through the though their behavior was not good, she wished to spare them. There, thereupon, Apsu, the begetter of the great gods, called Mumu, his vizier, and addressed him. Vizier Mumu, who gratifies my pleasure, come, let us go to Tiamat. They went and sat facing Tiamat, and they conferred about the gods, their sons. Apsu opened his mouth and addressed Tiamat. Their behavior has become displeasing to me, and I cannot rest in the daytime or sleep at night. I will destroy and break up their way of life, that silence may, re that silence may reign and we may sleep. When Tiamat heard this, she raged and cried out to her spouse. 
She cried in distress, fuming within herself. She grieved over the plotted evil. How can we destroy what we have given birth to? Though their behavior causes distress, let us tighten discipline graciously. Lulu spoke up with the counsel for Apsu, as from a rebellious vizier was the counsel of his Mumu. Destroy my father, that lawless way of life, that you may rest in the daytime and sleep by night. Apsu was pleased with him. His face beamed, because he had plotted evil against the gods, his sons. Mumu put his arms around Apsu's neck. He sat on his knees, kissing him. What they plotted in their gathering was reported to the gods, their sons. The gods heard it and were frantic. They were overcome with silence and sat quietly. Ea, who excels in knowledge, the skilled and learned. Ea, who knows everything, perceived their tricks. He fashioned it and made it to be all-embracing. He executed it skillfully as supreme, his pure incantation. He recited it and set it on the waters. He poured sleep upon him as he was slumbering deeply. He put Apsu to slumber as he poured out sleep. And Mumu, the counselor, was breathless with agitation. He split Apsu's sinews, ripped off his crown, carried away his aura and put it on himself. He bound Apsu and killed him. Mumu he confined and handled roughly. He set his dwelling upon Apsu and laid hold on Mumu, kept keeping the nose rope in his hand. After Ea bound and slain, his enemies had achieved victory over his foes. He rested quietly in his chamber. He called it Apsu, whose, sh whose shrines he appointed. Then he found his living quarters within it. And Ea and Dakin Damkina, his wife, sat in splendor in the chamber of the destinies, the room of the archetypes, the wisest of the wise, the sage of the gods. B.I. was conceived. In Apsu was, Mor was Marduk born. In pure Apsu was Marduk born. Ea, his father, begot him. Damkina, his mother, bore him. He sucked the breasts of the goddesses. A nurse reared him and filled him with terror. His figure was was well developed the glance of his eyes was dazzling his growth was manly he was mighty from the beginning anu his father's begetter saw him he exulted and smiled his heart filled with joy anu rendered him perfect his divinity was remarkable and he became very lofty excelling them in his attributes his members were incomprehensibly wonderful incapable of being grasped with the mind hard even to look on Four were his eyes, four were his ears. Flame shot forth as he moved his lips. His four ears grew large, and his eyes likewise took in everything. His figure was lofty and superior in comparison with the gods. His limbs were surpassing, his nature was superior. Mari Utu, Mari Utu, the sun, the sun god, the sun god of the sun, uh, the sun god of the gods. He was clothed with the aura of the ten gods, so exalted was his strength. The fifty dreads were loaded upon him. Anu formed and gave birth to the four winds. He delivered them to him. My son, let them whirl. He formed dust and set a hurricane to drive it. He made a wave to bring consternation on Tiamat. Tiamat was confounded. Day and night she was frantic. The gods took no rest. They, in their minds, they plotted evil and addressed their mother Tiamat. When Apsu, your spouse, was killed, you did not go at his side, but sat quietly. The four dreadful winds have been fashioned to throw you into confusion, and yet, and we cannot sleep. You gave no thought to Apsu, your spouse, nor to Mumu, who is a prisoner. Now you sit alone. Henceforth, you will be in frantic consternation. And as for us who cannot rest, you do not love us. Consider our burden, our eyes are hollow, Break the immovable yoke that we may sleep. Make battle, avenge them, reduce to nothingness. Tiamat heard. The speech pleased her. She said, let us make demons as you have advised. The gods assembled within her. They conceived evil against the gods, their begetters. They, and took the side of Tiamat. Fiercely plotting, unresting, night and day, lusting for battle, raging, storming, they set up a host to bring about conflict. Mother who Uber, who forms everything, supplied irresistible weapons and gave birth to giant serpents. They had sharp teeth. They were merciless. 
With poison instead of blood, she filled their bodies. She clothed the fearful monsters with dread. She loaded them with an aura and made them godlike. She said, let their onlooker feebly perish. May they constantly leap forward and never retire. She created the hydra, the dragon, the hairy hero, the great demon, the savage dog, and the scorpion man, fierce demons, the fish man, and the bull man, carriers of merciless weapons, fearless in the face of battle. Her commands were tremendous, not to be resisted. Altogether, she made eleven of that kind. Among the gods, her, son, her sons, whom she constituted her host, she exalted Quingu and magnified him among them. The leadership of the Arby and the direction of the host, the bearing of weapons campaigning, the mobilization of conflict, the chief executive power of battle, supreme command, she entrusted him and set him on a throne. I have cast the spell for you and exalted you in the host of the gods. I have delivered you the rule of all the gods. You are indeed exalted, my spouse. You are renowned. Let your commands pr prevail over the Anu Anunnaki. She gave him the Tablet of Destinies and fastened it to his breast, saying, Your order may not be changed. Let the utterance of your mouth be firm. After Quingu was elevated and had acquired the power of Ani ship, he created the destinies for the gods, her sons. May the utterance of your mouths subdue the fire god. May your poison by its ac accumulation put down aggression. Tablet 2. Tiamat gathered together her creation, an organized battle against the gods, her offspring. Henceforth, Tiamat plotted evil because of Apsu. It became known to Ea that she arranged the conflict. Ea heard this matter. He lapsed into silence in his chamber and sat motionless. After he had reflected and his anger had subsided, he directed his steps to Ansar, his father. He entered the presence of the father of his begetter, Ansar, and related to him all of Tiamat's plotting. My father, Tiamat, our mother, has convinced, uh, conceived a hatred for us. She has established a host in her savage fury. All the gods have turned to her. Even those you begat also take her side. They, they and took the side of Tiamat. Fiercely plotting, unresting by night and day, lusting for battle, raging, storming, they set up a host to bring about conflict. Mother who Uber, who forms everything, supplied irresistible weapons, and gave birth to giant stoop serpents. They had sharp teeth. They were merciless. With poison instead of blood, she filled their bodies. She clothed the fearful monsters with dread. She loaded them with an aura and made them godlike. She said, let their onlooker feebly perish. May they constantly leap forward and never retire. She created the hydra, the dragon, the hairy hero, the great demon, the savage dog, and the scorpion man fierce demons of the, f the fish man, the bull man. Did I read all of this? I guess it's just the same thing twice. Interesting. It's a bit repetitive. <laughs> We have this up here. And we have this here. Fierce demons, the fish man, the bull man, carriers of merciless weapons, fearless in the face of battle. Her commands were tremendous, not to be resisted. Altogether, she made eleven of that kind, among the gods, her sons, whom she constituted her host. She exalted Quingu and magnified him among them, the leadership of the army, the direction of the host, the bearing of weapons, campaigning, the mobilization of conflict, 
the chief executive power of battle, supreme command. She entrusted to him and set him on a throne. I have cast the spell for you and exalted you in the host of the gods. I have delivered to you the rule of all the gods. You are indeed exalted, my spouse. You are renowned. Let your commands prevail over all the Anunnaki. She gave him the tablet of destinies and fastened it to his breast, saying, Your order may not be changed. Let the utterance of your mouth be firm. After Quingu was elevated and had acquired the power of Anuship, he decreed the destinies for the gods, her sons. May the utterance of your mouth subdue the fire god. May your poison by its accumulation put down aggression. Ansar heard the matter was profoundly disturbing. He cried, Woe! and bit his lip. His heart was in fury. His mind could not be calmed. Over Ea, his son, his cry was faltering. My son, you who provoked the war, take responsibility for whatever you alone have done. You set out and killed Apsu, and as for Tiamat, whom you made furious, where is her equal? The gatherer of counsel, the learned prince, the god, the creator of wisdom, the god Nudimud, with soothing words and calming utterance, gently answered his father Ansar. My father, deep mind, who decrees destiny, who has the power to bring into being and destroy. Ansar, deep mind, who decrees destiny, who has the power to bring into being and to destroy. I want to say something to you. Calm down for me for a moment, and consider that I performed a helpful deed before I killed Apsu. Who could have seen the present situation? Before I quickly made an end of him, what were the circumstances were I to destroy him? Ansar heard the wo- and Ansar heard the words pleased him. His heart relaxed to speak to Ea. My son, your deeds are fitting for a god. You are capable of a fierce, unqual- unqualled blow. Ea, your deeds are fitting for a god. You are capable of a fierce, unequaled blow. Go before Tiamat and appease her attack, her fury with your incantation. He heard the speech of Ansar, his father. He took the road to her, proceeded on the route to her. He went, he perceived the tricks of Tiamat. He stopped, fell silent, and turned back. He entered the presence of August Ansar, patiently addressing him. My father, Tiamat's deeds are too much for me. I perceived her planning, and my incantation was not equal to it. Her strength is mighty. She is full of dread. She is altogether very strong. None can go against her. Her very loud cry did not diminish. I became afraid of her cry and turned back. My father, do not lose hope. Send a second person against her. Though a woman's strength is very great, it is not equal to a man's. Let's see. The dawn of patriarchy. Right there. Disband her cohorts. Break up her plans before she lays her hands on us. Ansar cried out in intense fury, addressing Anu, his son. Honored son, hero, warrior, whose strength is mighty, whose attack is irre- irresistible. Hasten and stand before Tiamat. Appease her rage that her heart may relax. If she does not hearken to your words, answer her words of petition that she may be appeased. He heard the speech of Ansar, his father. He took the road to her, proceeded on the route to her. Ani went. He perceived the tricks of Tiamat. He stopped, fell silent, and turned back. He entered the presence of Ansar, the father who begat him, penitently addressing him, My father, Tiamat's deeds are too much for me. I perceived her planning, but my incantation was not equal to it. Her strength is mighty. She is full of dread. She is altogether very strong. No one can go against her. Her very loud noise does not diminish. I became afraid of her cry and turned back. My father, do not lose hope. Send another person against her. Though a woman's strength is very great, it is not equal to a man's. Disband her cohorts, break up her plans, before she lays her hands on us. Ansar lapsed into silence, staring at the ground. He nodded to Ea, shaking his head, and Igigi and all the Anuki had assembled, and they sat in tight-lipped silence. No god would go to face, would go out, get, would go out against Tiamat. Yet the Lord Ansar, the father of the great gods, was angry in his heart and did not summon anyone. A mighty son, the avenger of his father, he who hastens to war, the warrior Marduk. Ea summoned him to his private chamber to explain to him his plans. Marduk, give counsel. Listen to your father. You are my son who gives me pleasure. Go reverently before Ansar. Speak. Take your stand. Appease him with your glance. Be I rejoiced at his father's be I rejoiced at his father's words. 
He drew near and stood in the presence of Ansar. Ansar saw him, his heart filled with satisfaction. He kissed his lips and removed his fear. My father, do not hold your peace, but speak forth. I will go and fulfill your desires. Ansar, do not hold your peace, but speak forth. I will go and fulfill your desires, which man has drawn up his battle array against you, and will Tiamat, who is a woman, attack you with her weapons? My father, begetter, rejoice and be glad. Soon you will tread on the neck of Tiamat. So Tiamat is associated with serpents. She makes all these serpent creatures. Um, so this is very much like the fall creation and the serpent the defeat of the serpent um who is this feminine energy and represents the religious order that came before ansar begetter rejoice and be glad soon you will tread on the neck of tiamat go my son conversant with all knowledge appease tiamat with your pure spell drive the storm chariot without delay and with a uh, with which cannot be repelled, turn her back. Be I rejoiced at his father's words. With glad heart he addressed his father. Lord of the gods, destiny of the great gods, if I should become your avenger, if I should buy Tiamat and preserve you, convene an assembly and proclaim for me an exalted destiny, sit all of you in Sukinaku with gladness and let me with my utterance decree destinies instead of you. Whatever I instigate must not be changed, nor may my command be nullified or altered. Tablet 3. Ansar opened his mouth and addressed Kaka, his vizier. Vizier Kaka, who gratifies my pleasure, I will send you to La Amu and, La and Lamu. You are skilled in making inquiry learned in address. Have the gods, my fathers, brought to my presence. Let all the gods be brought. Let them confer as they sit at table. Let them eat grain. Let them drink ale. Let them decree the destiny for Marduk, their avenger. Be Go, be gone, Kaka. Stand before them and repeat to them all that I tell you. Ansar, your son, has sent me, and I am to explain his plans. I sent Anu so these notes from lines 15 to 52 instead of my father put thus okay um i don't know some notes about different translations i sent anu but he could not face her nudimud took fright and retired marduk the sage of the gods your son has come forward he is determined to meet tiamat he has spoken with to me and said quickly now decree your destiny for him without delay that he may go and face your powerful enemy kaka went he directed his steps to lamu and laamu gods his fathers he prostrated himself he kissed the ground before them he got up saying to them he stood when laamu and, La and lamu heard they cried aloud all igigi moaned in distress all the igigi moaned in, dis moaned in distress what has gone wrong that she took this decision about us we did not know what Tiamat was doing. All the great gods who decree destinies gathered as they went. They entered the presence of Ansar and became filled with joy. They kissed one another as they in the assembly. They conferred as they sat at the table. They ate grain. They drank ale. They strained the sweet liquor through their straws. And they drank beer and felt good. And they became quite carefree. Their mood was merry. And they decreed the fate for Marduk, their avenger. Tablet 4. They set a lordly dais for him, and he took his seat before his fathers to receive kingship. They said, You are the most honored among the great gods. Your destiny is unequaled. Your command is like Anu's. Marduk, you are the most honored among the great gods. Your destiny is unequaled. Your command is like Anu's. Henceforth, your order will not be annulled. It is in your power to exalt at a base. Your utterance is sure. Your command cannot be rebelled against. None of the gods will transgress the line you draw. Shrines for all the gods needs provisioning, that you may be established where their sanctuaries are. You are Marduk, our avenger. We have given you kingship over the sum of the holy universe. Take your seat in the assembly. Let your word be exalted. Let your weapons not miss the mark, but may they slay your enemies. Be I, 
spare him who trusts in you, but destroy the God who has who set his mind on evil. They set a constellation in the middle and addressed Marduk, their son. Your destiny, be I, is superior to that of all the gods. Command and bring about annihilation and recreation. Let the constellation disappear at your utterance. With a second command, let the constellation reappear. He gave the command and the constellation disappeared. With a second command, the constellation came into being again. When the gods, his fathers, saw the effect of his utterance, they rejoiced and offered congratulation. Marduk is king, and they added him a mace, a throne, and a rod. They gave him an irresistible weapon that overwhelms the foe. They said, go, cut Tiamat's throat, and let the winds bear up her blood to give the news. The gods, his fathers, decreed the destiny of B.I. and set him on the road, the way of prosperity and success. He fashioned a bow and made it his weapon. He set an arrow in place, put the bowstring on. He took up his club and held it in his right hand. His bow and quiver he hung at his side. He placed lightning before him and filled his body with tongues of flame. He made a net to enmesh the entrails of Tiamat and stationed the four winds so that no part of her escape. The south wind, the north wind, the east wind, the west wind. He put besides his net winds given by his father Anu. He fashioned the evil wind, the dust storm, tempest, fourfold wind, sevenfold wind, the chaos spreading wind, the wind... He sent out the seven winds that he had fashioned, and they took their stand behind him to harass Tiamat's entrails. B.I. took up the storm flood, his great weapon. He rode the fearful chariot of, ir of the irresistible storm. Four steeds he yoked to it and harnessed them to it, the destroyer, the merciless, the trampler, the fleet. Their lips were parted, their teeth bore venom. They were strangers to weariness, trained to sweep forward. At his right hand he stationed raging battle and strife, on the left conflict that overwhelms a united battle array. He was clad in a tunic, a fearful coat of mail, and on his head he wore an aura of terror. B.I. proceeded and set out his way. He set his face towards the raging Tiamat. In his lips he held a spell. He grasped a plant to counter the poison in his hand. Thereupon they milled around him. The gods milled around him. The gods his father milled fathers milled around him, the gods milled around him. B.I. drew near, sur surveying the raw, the maw of Tiamat. He observed the tricks of Queen Gu, her spouse. As he looked, he lost his nerve. His determination went, and he faltered. His divine aides, who were marching at his sides, saw the warrior, the foremost, and their vision became dim. Tiamat cast her spell without turning her neck. In her lips she held untruth and lies. In there they have assembled you. B.I. lifted up the storm flood, his great weapon, and with these words threw it at the raging Tiamat. Why are you aggressive and arrogant and strive to provoke battle? The younger generation have shouted, outraging their elders, but you, their mother, hold pity in contempt. Queen Gu you have named to be your spouse, and you have improperly appointed him the rank of Anu ship. Against Ansar, king of the gods, you have stirred up trouble, and against the gods, my fathers, your trouble is established. Deploy your troops, gird on your weapons, you and I will take our stand and do battle. When Tiamat heard this, she went insane and lost her reason. Tiamat cried aloud and fiercely. All her lower members trembled beneath her. She was reciting an incantation, kept reciting her spell. When the battle gods were sharpening their weapons of war, Tiamat and Marduk, the sage of the gods, came together. Joining in strife, drawing near to battle, B.I. spread out his net and enmeshed her. He let loose the evil wind, the the rear guard in her face. Tiamat opened her mouth to swallow it. She let the evil wind in so that she could not close her lips. The fierce winds weighed down her belly. Her inwards were distended, and she opened her mouth wide. He let fly an arrow and pierced her belly. Tor opened her entrails and slit her inwards. He bound her and extinguished her life. He threw down her corpse and stood on it. After he had killed, he threw down her corpse and stood on it. After he had killed Tiamat, the leader, he, her assembly dispersed, her host scattered. Her, divi her divine aides, 
who went beside her in trembling and fear beat a retreat to save their lives but they were completely surrounded unable to escape he bound them and broke their weapons and they lay enmeshed sitting in a snare hiding in corners filled with grief bearing his punishment held in a prison the eleven creatures who were laden with fearfulness the throng of devils who went as grooms at her right hand he put ropes upon them and bound their arms together with their warfare he trampled them beneath him now quingu who had risen to power among them he bound and reckoned with the dead gods he took from him the tablet of destinies which was not properly his sealed it with a seal and fastened it to his own breast and the warrior marduk had bound and slain his enemy after the warrior marduk had bound and slain his enemies had the arrogant enemy had established victory for ansar over all his foes had fulfilled the desire of nuribud he strengthened his hold on the bound gods and returned to tiamat whom he had bound bi placed his feet on the lower parts of tiamat and with his merciless club smashed her skull he severed her arteries and let the north wind bear up her blood to give the news his fathers saw it and were glad and exulted they brought gifts and presents to him bi rested surveying the corpse in order to divide the lump by a clever scheme he split her in two like a dried fish one half of her he set up and stretched out as the heavens he stretched the skin and appointed a watch with the instruction not to let her waters escape he crossed over the heavens surveyed the celestial parts and adjusted them to match the apsu nudimud's abode bi measured the shape of the apsu and set up esara a replica of esgala in esgala esara which he had built and the heavens he settled in their shrines anu and leo and ea so in tablet four marduk attacks the serpent rips her in two stretches her across the sky and makes the heavens and the earth with her the serpent his mother tablet five he fashioned heavenly stations for the great gods and set up constellations the patterns of the stars he appointed the year marked off divisions and set up three stars each for the twelve months after he had organized the year he established the heavenly station of nibiru to fix the stars intervals that none should sh transgress or be slothful he fixed the heavenly stations of Anlil and Ea with it. Gates he opened on both sides and put strong bolts on the, at the left and the right. He placed the heights of heavens in her Tiamat's belly. He created Dadar, entrusting him to him the night. He appointed him as the jewel of the night to fix the days. And month by month, without ceasing, he elevated him with a crown, saying, Shine over the land at the beginning of the month resplendent with horns to five to fix six days on the seventh day the crown will be half size on the fifteenth day halfway through each month stand in opposition when sama sees you on the horizon diminish in the proper stages and shine backwards on the twenty-ninth day draw near to the path of samas the thirtieth day stand in junk stand in conjunction and rival samas i have the sign follow its track draw near give judgment Samas constrain murder and violence. Me, at the end, let there be the twenty-ninth day, after he had the decrees, the organization of front, and he made the day, let the year be equally at the new year, the year, let there be regularly the projecting bolt, after he had the watches of night and day, the foam which Tiamat Marduk fashioned, he gathered it together and made it into clouds raging of the winds violent rainstorms the billowing of mist the accumulation of her spittle he appointed for himself and took them in his hand he put her head in position and poured out he opened the abyss and it was sated with water from her two eyes he let the euphrates and tigris flow he blocked her nostrils but left he heaped up the distant mountains on her breasts he bored wells to channel the springs he twisted her tail and wove it into the dur mahu and the opsu beneath his feet he set up her crotch it wedged 
up he set up her crotch it wedged up the heavens thus the half of her he stretched out and made it as firm as the earth after he had finished his work inside tiamat he spread his net and let it right out he surveyed the heavens and the earth their bonds after he had formulated his regulations and composed his decrees he attached guide ropes and put them in ea's hands the tablet of destinies which quingu had taken and carried he took charge of it as a trophy to present it and presented it to anu the of battle which he had tied on or had put on his head he brought before his fathers now the eleven creatures to which tiamat had given birth and he broke their weapons and bound them the creatures to his feet he made images of them and stationed them at the gate of the apsu to be a sign never to be forgotten the gods saw it and were jubilantly happy that is lamu and laamu and all his fathers ansar embraced him and published abroad his title victorious king anu anlil and ea gave him gifts mother damkina who bore him hailed him with a clean festal robe she made his face shine to usmu who held her present to give the news he entrusted the visit of apsu and the care of the holy places the ikigi assembled and did and all did ob ob obeisance to him every one of the anunnaki was kissing his feet they all gathered to show their submission they stood they bowed down behold the king his fathers and took their fill of his beauty be i listened to their utterance being girded with the dust of battle anointing his body with cedar perfume he clothed himself in his lordly robe with a crown of terror as a royal aura he took up his club and held it in his right hand he grasped in his left he set his feet he put upon the scepter of prosperity and success he hung at his side after he had the aura he adorned his sack the apsu with a fearful was settled like in his throne room in his cellar every one of the gods lamu and laamu opened their mouths and addressed the igigi gods previously marduk was our beloved son now he is your king heed his command next they all spoke up together his name is Lugal, Lug al Dimmerikia. Trust in him. When they had given the kingship to Marduk, they addressed it to him a benediction for prosperity and success. Henceforth you are the caretaker of our shrine. Whatever you command, we will do. Marduk opened his mouth to speak and addressed the gods, his fathers. Above the Apsu, the emerald abode, opposite Esara, which I built for you beneath the celestial parts whose floors I made firm, I will build a house to be my luxurious abode. Within it I will establish its shrine. I will found my chamber and establish my kingship. When you come up from the Apsu to make a decision, this will be your resting place before the assembly. When you descend from heaven to make a decision, this will be your resting place before the assembly. I shall call its name Babylon, homes, the homes of the great gods. Within it we will hold a festival. That will be the evening festival. The gods, his fathers, heard his, this speech of his. They said, With regard to all that your hands have made, who has your... With regard to the earth that your hands have made, who has your... In Babylon, as you have named it, put our resting place forever. Let them bring our regular offerings. Whoever our task which we there in its toil, they rejoiced the gods he who knows them he opened his mouth showing them light his speech he made wide them and the gods bowed down speaking to him they addressed lugal dimmerakia their lord formerly lord you were our beloved son now you are our king he who preserved us the aura of club and scepter let him conceive plans that we so much of that tablet was lost but you get the gist. Marduk is crowned king of the gods. Two more tablets to go. How long have we been reading? 48 minutes. Okay, that's not bad. You can get through the whole thing in an hour. When Marduk heard the god's speech, he conceived a desire to accomplish clever things. He opened his mouth, addressing Ea. He counsels that which he had pondered in his heart. I will bring together blood to form bone. I will bring into being Lulu, whose name shall be Man. I will create Lulu, Man, on whom the toil of the gods will be laid, that they may rest. 
I will skillfully alter the organization of the gods. Though they are honored as one, they shall be divided into two, Ea answered as he addressed him, a word to him, expressing his comments on the resting of the gods. Let one brother of theirs be given up. Let him perish that people may be fashioned. Let the great gods assemble, and let the guilty one be given up that they may be confirmed. Marduk assembled the great gods, using gracious direction as he gave his order. As he spoke, the gods heeded him. The king addressed the wor a word to the Anunnaki. Your formal oath was true indeed. Now, also, tell me the solemn truth. Who is the one who, invest who instigated warfare, who made Tiamat rebel and set battle in motion? Let him who instigated warfare be given up, that I may lay his punishment upon him. But you sit and rest. The Igigi, the great gods, answered him. That is, Lugal de Merikia, counselor of the gods, the lord. Quingu is the one who instigated warfare, who made Tiamat rebel and set battle in motion. They bound him, holding him before Ea. They inflicted the penalty upon him and severed his blood vessels. From his blood he, Ea, created mankind, on whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. After the wise Ea had created mankind and had imposed the service on the gods upon them, that task is beyond comprehension, for Nudimud performed the creation with the skill of Marduk. King Marduk divided the gods, all the Anunnaki, into upper and lower groups. He assigned three hundred in the heavens to guard the decrees of Anu. He appointed them as a guard. Next, he arranged the organization of the netherworld. In heaven and netherworld, he stationed six hundred gods. After he had arranged all the decrees and had distributed incomes among the Anunnaki of heaven and netherworld, the Anunnaki opened their mouths and addressed their lord Marduk. Now, lord, seeing you have established our freedom, what favor can we do for you? Let us make a shrine of great renown. Your chamber will be our resting place wherein we may repose. Let us erect a shrine to house a pedestal wherein we may repose when we finish the work. When Marduk heard this, he, he beamed as brightly as the light of day. Build Babylon, the task you have sought. Let brisk, bricks for it be molded and raise the shrine. The Anunnaki wielded the pick. For one year they made the needed bricks. When the second year arrived, they raised the peak of Escalil, a replica of the Apsu. They built the lofty temple, temple tower of the Apsu. And for Anu, Anlil, and Ea, they established it as a dwelling. He sat in splendor before them, surveying its horns, which were level with the base of Esara. And after they had completed the work on es Esagil, all the Anunnaki constructed their own shrine. Three hundred Ikigi of heaven and six hundred of the Apsu, all of them had assembled. B.I. seated the gods, his fathers, at the banquet, in the lofty shrine which they had built for his dwelling, saying, This is Babylon your fixed dwelling. Take your pleasure here. Sit down in joy. The great gods sat down. Beer mugs were set out, and they sat at the banquet. After they had enjoyed themselves inside, they held a service in awesome Esagil. The regulations and all the rules were confirmed. All the gods divided the stations of heaven and the netherworld. The college of fifty great gods took their seats. The seven gods of destinies were appointed to give decisions. B.I. received his weapon, the bow, and laid it before them. His divine father saw the net which he had made. His fathers saw how skillfully wrought was the structure of the bow, and they praised what he had made. Anu lifted it up in the divine assembly. He kissed the bow, saying, It is my daughter. Thus he called the names of the bow. Long stick was the first, the second was, may it hit the mark. But with the third name, Bow Star, he made it shine in, in the sky. He fixed its heavenly position along with its divine brothers. After Anu had decreed the destiny of the bow, he set down a royal throne, a lofty one even for a god. Anu set it there in the assembly of the gods. The great gods assembled. They exalted the destiny of Marduk and did obeisance. They invoked a curse on themselves, and they took an oath with water and oil and put their hands to their throats. They granted him the right to exercise kingship over the gods. They confirmed him as lord of the gods in heaven and the netherworld. Ansar gave him his exalted name, Asuluhi. At the mention of his name, let us show him submission. When he speaks, let the gods heed him. 
Let his command be superior in upper and lower regions. May the Son, our Avenger, be exalted. Let his Lordship be superior in himself without rival. Let him shepherd the black heads, his creatures. Let them tell of his character to future days without forgetting. Let him establish lavish food offerings for his fathers. Let him provide for their maintenance and be caretaker of all their sanctuaries. Let him burn incense to rejoice their sanctums. Let him do earth the same as he has done in heaven. Let him appoint the blackheads to worship him. The subject humans should take note and call on their gods, since he commands that they should heed their goddesses. Let food offerings be brought for their gods and goddesses. May they not be forgotten. May they remember their gods. May they their may they their shrines through the blackheads worship some someone, some other though the blackheads worship someone, some other god, he is the god of each and every one of us. Come, let us call the fifty names of him whose character is resplendent, whose achievement is the same, Marduk, as he was named by his father Anu from his birth who supplies pasturage and watering, making the stables flourish, who bound the boastful with his weapon, the storm flood, and saved the gods, his fathers, from distress. He is the sun, the sun god of the gods. He is dazzling. Let them ever walk in his bright light. On the peoples that he created, the living beings, he imposed the service of the gods, and they took rest. Creation and annihilation, forgiveness and exacting the penalty occur at his command, so let them fix their eyes up on him. Murak, Mur Muruka, he is the god who created them, who put the Anunnaki at ease, the Igigi at rest. Mar Marutuku, he is the support of land, city, and its peoples. Henceforth let the peoples ever heed him. Mursakusu, fierce yet deliberating, angry yet relenting. His, wide is, his mind is wide, his heart all-embracing. Lugaldeberekia is the name by which we called him, whose command we have exalted above that of the gods, his fathers. He is the lord of all the gods of heaven and netherworld, the king at whose injunctions the god in upper and lower regions shudder. Nare Lugaldeberekia is the name we gave him, the mentor of every god, who established our dwellings in heaven and netherworld in time of trouble who distributed the heavenly stations between Igigi and Anunnaki. Let the gods tremble at his name and quake in their seats. Asaluhi is the name by which his father Anu called him. He is the light of the gods, a mighty hero, who, as his name says, is pr a protecting angel for God and land, who, by a terrible combat, saved our dwelling in a time of trouble. Asaluhi Namtia, as they called him secondly, the life-giving God, who, in accordance with the form of his name, restored all the ruined gods, the Lord, who, bright, who brought to life the dead gods by his pure incantation, let us praise him as the destroyer of the crooked enemies. Asalui Namru was his name, he is called, as his name is called thirdly, the pure God who cleanses our character. Ansar, Lamu, Laamu, each called him by three of his names, when they addressed the gods, their sons. We have each called him by three of his names. Now you call his names like us. The gods rejoiced as they heard their speech. In Upsukanaki they held a conference. Of the warrior son, our avenger, of the provisioner, let us extol the name. They sat down in their assembly, summoning the deities, and with all due rites they called his name. Now we're on to the last tablet. this tablet the introduction said that on the Babylonian New Year they would recite this tablet um, during a parade when a statue of Marduk was paraded from the high temple to a special place <laughs> they would recite tablet 7 the final tablet Asarare the giver of arable land who established plow land the creator of barley and flax who made plant life grow Asaralim, who is revered in the council chamber, whose council excels, the gods heed it and grasp fear of him. 
Asara Limnuna, the noble, the light of the father, his begetter, who directs the decrees of Anu, Enlil, and Ea, that is, Nin Siku. He is their provisioner who assigns their incomes, whose turban multiplies the abundance for the land. Tutu is he who accomplishes their renovation. Let him purify their sanctuaries that he may repose. Let him fashion an incantation that the gods may rest. Though they may rise up in fury, let them withdraw. He is indeed exalted in the assembly of the gods, his fathers. No one among the gods can equal him. Tutu Z Zuikina, the life of his host, who established the pure heavens for the gods, who took charge of their councils, who appointed their stations, may he not be forgotten among mortals, but let them remember his deeds. Tutu Ziku, they called him thirdly, the establisher of purification, the god of the pleasant breeze, lord of success and obedience, who produces bounty and wealth, who establishes abundance, who turns everything scant that we have into profusion, who pl whose pleasant breeze we sniffed in time of terrible trouble. Let men command that his praises be constantly uttered. Let them offer worship to him. As Tutu Agaku, fourthly, let humans extol him, lord of the pure incantation, who brought the dead back to life, who showed mercy on the bound gods, who threw the imposed yoke on the gods, his enemies and to spare them created mankind, the merciful in whose power it is to restore to life. Let his words be sure and not forgotten from the mouths of the black heads, his creatures, as Tutu Tuku fifthly, let their mouth give expressions to his pure spell, who extirpated all the wisdom by his pure incantation. Sazu, who knew the heart of the gods, who saw the reins, who did not let an evildoer escape from him, who established the assembly of the gods, who rejoiced in their, who rejoiced their hearts, who subjugated the disobedient, he is the gods encompassing protection. He made truth to prosper, he uprooted perverse speech, he separated falsehood from truth. As Zazuzisi, secondly, let them continually praise him, the subduer of aggressors, who ousted consternation from the bodies of the gods, his fathers. Zazu Surim, thirdly, who extirpated every foe with his weapons, who confounded their plans and turned them into wind. He snuffed out all the wicked who came against him. Let the gods ever shout acclamations in the assembly. Sazu Sugurim, fourthly, who established success for the gods, his fathers who extirpated foes and destroyed their offspring, who scattered their achievements, needing no part of them. Let his name be spoken and proclaimed in the land. As Sazu Zaharim, fifthly, let future generations discuss him, the destroyer of every rebel, of all the disobedient, who brought all the fugitive gods into the shrines. Let this name of his be established. As Sazu Zagurim, sixthly, let them altogether and everywhere worship him who himself destroyed all the foes in battle. And Builu is he, the Lord, who supplies them abundantly, their great chosen one who provides cereal offerings, who keeps pasturage and watering in good condition and established it for the land, who opened water courses and distributed plentiful water. And Builu Ipadan, Lord of common land, let them call him secondly. Canal, canal supervisor of heaven and netherworld who sets the furrow, who establishes clean, arable land in the open country, who directs irrigation ditch and canal and marks out the furrow, as an Bulilu Gugal, canal supervisor of the watercourses of the gods, let them praise him thirdly. Lord of abundance, profusion, and huge stores of grain, who provides bounty, who enriches human habitations, who gives wheat and brings grain into being, and Bilui Higal, who accumulates abundance for the peoples, who rains down riches on the broad earth and supplies abundant vegetation. Sir, sir, who heaped up a mountain on top of Tiamat, who plundered the corpse of Tiamat with his weapons, the guardian of the land, their trustworthy shepherd, whose hair is a growing crop, whose turban is a furrow, who kept crossing the broad sea in his fury and kept crossing over the place of her battle as though it were a bridge. Sir, sir, Mala, as they named him secondly, so be it. Tiamat was his boat, he was her sailor. Gil, whoever heaps up piles of barley, massive mounds, the creator of grain and flocks who gives seed for the land, 
Gilma, who made the bond of the gods firm, who created stability, a snare that overwhelmed them, yet extended favors. Agilma, the lofty, who snatches off the crown, who takes charge of snow, who created the earth on water and made firm the heaven, the height of heaven. Zulum, who assigns meadows for the gods and divides up what he has created, who gives incomes and food offerings, who administers shrines. Mumu, creator of heaven and heaven and underworld, who protects refugees, the god who purified heaven and underworld. Secondly, Zulumu, in respect of whose strength none other among the gods can equal him. Gisnum Manav, creator of all the peoples, who made the world regions, who destroyed Tiamat's gods, whom and made peoples the part of from part of them, and who destroyed Tiamat's gods and made peoples from part of them. Lugal Lugalabdubur, the king who scattered the works of Tiamat, who uprooted her weapons, whose foundation is secure on the fore and aft. Pagalulena, foremost of all lords, whose strength is exalted, who is the greatest among the gods, his brothers, the most noble of them all. Lugal Durma, king of the bond of the gods, Lord Durma, who is the greatest of the royal abode, infinitely more lofty than the other gods. Aranuna, counselor of Ea, creator of gods, his fathers, whom no god can equal in respect of his lordly walk. Lordly walk. Dum Dumuduku, who renews for himself his pure abode in Duku. Dumuduku, without whom Lugalduku does not make a decision. Lugal Susana, the king whose strength is exalted among the guards. The lord, the strength of Anu, who, he who is supreme, chosen of Ansar. Irugua, who plundered them all in the sea, who grasps all wisdom, is comprehensive in understanding. Irquingu, who plundered Quingu in battle, who directs all decrees and establishes lordship. Kinma, the director of all the gods, who gives counsel, at whose name the gods bend down in reverence before a hurricane. Dingir, Esiskur, let him take his lofty, lofty seat in the house of benediction. Let the gods bring their presence before him until he receives their offering. No one but he accomplishes clever things. The four regions of black heads are his creation. Apart from him, no god knows the measure of their days. Giru, who makes weapons hard, who accomplished clever things in the battle with Tiamat. Comprehensive in wisdom, skilled in understanding, a deep mind that all the gods combined do not understand. Let Adu be his name. Let him cover the whole span of heaven. Let him thunder with his pleasant voice upon the earth. May the rumble fill the clouds and give sustenance to the peoples below. Asaru, who, as his name says, mustered the divine fates. He indeed is the warden of absolutely all peoples. As Neberu, let him hold the crossing place of heaven and underworld. They should not cross above or below, but should wait for him. Neberu is his star, which he caused to shine in the sky. Let him take his stand on the heavenly staircase, that they may look at him. Yes, he who constantly crosses the sea without resting, let his name be Nibiru, who grasps her middle. Let him fix the paths of the stars of heaven. Let him shepherd all the gods like sheep. Let him bind Tiamat and put her life in mortal danger. To generations yet unborn, to distant future days, may he continue unchecked, may he persist into eternity. Since he created the heavens and fashioned the earth, Anlil the Father called him by his own name, the Lord of the Lands. Ea heard the names which all the Ikihi called, and his spirit became radiant. Why, he whose name was extolled by his fathers, let him, like me, be called Ea. Let him control the sum of all my rights. Let him administer all my decrees. With the word fifty, the great gods called his fifty names and assigned him an outstanding position. They should be remembered. A leading figure should expound them. The wise and learned should confer about them. A father should repeat them and teach them to his son. One should explain them to the shepherd and herdsman. If one is not negligent to Marduk, the Enlil of the gods, may one's land f flourish and oneself prosper. For his word is reliable, his command unchanged. No god can alter the utterance of his mouth. When he looks in fury, he does not relent. When his anger is ablaze, no god can face him. His mind is deep, his spirit is all-embracing, before whom sin and transgression are sought out, instruction which a leading figure repeated before him, Marduk. 
he wrote it down and stored it so that generations to come might hear it. Marduk, who created the Ikigi gods, though they diminish, let them call on his name, the son of Marduk, who defeated Tiamat and took kingship. So that's the Enuma Elish, the triumph of Marduk over Tiamat. Conclusion. The Enuma Elish was a mythological work as a mythological work is timeless, but some scholars have argued that in its day it would, have it would have resonated with an audience who understood Babylon as a city breaking with the traditions of the past to create a new and better future. Scholar Thorkid Jacobson, for example, notes, Babylon warred with the territory of ancient Sumer and all its renowned and venerable ancient cities and their gods. It waged an upstart's war with its own parent civilization. And that and that this was a live issue, that Babylon was keenly aware of being heir to and continuer of Sumerian civilization, is clear from the fact that its kings, especially those of the latter half of the Selen dynasty, sort, sport elaborate Sumerian names, Sumerian na Sumerianized names. Understandably, therefore, Babylon might have felt, consciously or unconsciously, its victory to be, in some sense, patricidal. The story then can be read not only as a grand tale of triumph of over order over chaos and light over darkness, but as a parable for the rise of Babylon and Babylonian culture over the old Sumerian model of civilization. Further, the terror can be understood as an illustration of the concept of life as perpetual change. The old static gods in the story are replaced by younger and more dynamic gods who then introduce the concept of change and mutability to the universe through their creation of mortal beings who are subject to death. These creatures are tasked with helping the gods maintain their creation, and so, although they are not themselves eternal, play an integral role in the eternal work of the gods. About the author, Joshua R. Mark is a freelance writer and part-time professor of philosophy at Marist College in New York. And that is one version of the Enuma Elish. Thanks for listening to it with me more to come.